From the New York Institute for the Humanities, I'm Melanie Rahak. Patrick Radden Keefe is a staff writer at The New Yorker. We have known each other since 2003 when we were fellows together at the Kalman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. He is the author of three books, most recently Say Nothing, a true story of murder and memory in Northern Ireland. Which brings me to the topic of our conversation today, Belfast. Patrick, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to just throw out a big softball open-ended question first to see what you've got for us, which is, did you have a relationship with Belfast before you wrote Say Nothing? I'd been there. I don't know that I would call it a relationship. I'd had um, a couple of experiences which were both interesting in different ways. When I was, um, God, I was probably in high school. I visited the Republic of Ireland with my father and we went to Donegal, which is where some of his family is from, though a long way back in the 19th century. And um, we ended up driving across the border into Northern Ireland. So this is the 1990s. And there was a point in which a, a transport pulled up and these two columns of soldiers started walking the street, which I very vividly remember these British soldiers on the street in this little village in Northern Ireland. And then a few years later, in 1999, when I was in grad school, I spent a very drunken weekend in Belfast. <laughs> My recollections are, are pretty impressionistic. But I do remember, actually, again, these armored transports, even then in 99, that were out in the streets when we were out um, drinking ourselves silly. But that was it. And I, I didn't, when I was in Belfast for that 36 hours or whatever it was, I didn't really do anything meaningful. It was more just, just visiting a friend. Uh, so it was only when I got started on this project that I got to know the city in a serious way. And did you have sort of a, a deeper, I don't know, family existential relationship to it? I mean, you mentioned your father's family was from there, obviously many generations before. I mean, did that give you sort of an extra edge to your thoughts about it or? It really didn't. It's funny. I when I wrote this book, the first 29 chapters of the book are written in this third-person, historical, omniscient voice. There's no me in there. You don't even get the New Yorker style, not long ago, he told me kind of things. And my British editor at a certain point said, you have to address your name. You know, with a name like Patrick Keefe. It'll feel like there's something undeclared <laughs> um, and you need to come clean with it. And and so I did in the final chapter of the book. But really what I said is I grew up with this very Irish American name and a father whose family was from Ireland. But y you have to go back to the 19th century. I mean, it was a pretty tenuous connection. And to the degree that I grew up in, a, in an Irish American milieu in which there was a a prevailing sentimental attachment to the old country. That was something which, even as a pretty young person, I was a bit skeptical of myself. How so? Well, I was just suspicious of it. I didn't... There's 30 million Irish Americans and far more Irish Americans than there are people in Ireland. And I think there's a tendency among the Irish Americans to want to feel this very genuine bond with Ireland. And then you get to Ireland and you realize actually it's it's a different culture. It's a you know, to be Irish American is a kind of a distinct thing. And so I think I got that. I got that the dyeing the river green and clovers and Guinness and the luck of the Irish and Aaron Gobra and all that stuff that it there was an an element of cliche to it uh, that I just didn't, I didn't really relate to. So no, I mean, the strange thing here for me was that um, I came across this story just in the context of my day job and I approached it the way I would any other story. So I was going to say you had this, this childhood skepticism and yet somehow found yourself later in life in this very place that you had sort of expressed or maybe not expressed, but, but at least, you know, held on to a considered skepticism about. So what, I mean, was there any sort of, and you mentioned it's obviously a completely different culture. It's not this nostalgic leprechauns and, and shamrocks, but was there any sort of, what was that encounter like to sort of land in this place? 
that you had in, in some ways written off other than your drunken weekend, I guess. Yeah. Um, and discover it as as a real place to begin with, but then also as the place it is now as opposed to the way it was when you when I was write about, about it, it in your book. Yeah, I mean, boy, there's a lot to unpack there. So part of it, I would say, is it's not that I'd, I'd written off Ireland per se, and in fact, I'd been to Dublin a bunch of times and loved Dublin. My sense of the North was... You know, mostly an imaginary sense. Uh, it was it was kind of a different series of cliches, right? It was like Tim Pat Coogan books and U two songs. I didn't really have that clear a sense of the troubles and how they'd played out. And I think particularly, I had a sense, and I actually think this is a pretty widespread sense among a lot of Americans, even relatively well informed Americans, that the Good Friday Agreement had ended the troubles in 1998, and everything kind of came up roses. That it was a there was a punctuation point at the end of this three-decade conflict and that if you were to go to a city like Belfast, things were much better now. And to the extent that I had recollections of that, those a couple of evenings out in 1999, that was, you know, 98 was the was the peace agreement. So it, it felt as though my, my drunken recollections of those armored personnel carriers felt like that was kind of the hangover of the conflict. But if you were to go today, everything would be great. And when I went... Um, so what year what year did you first go when you were doing your So I started this New Yorker piece in 2014. Okay. And I went twice for the piece and so the first time I went was probably like the spring of 2014 or the summer of 2014. And um it's strange, you know, I mean on the one hand things are feel safe relatively and there's a lot of ways in which Belfast, the center of Belfast, seems like any other. You know, I stayed in a Hilton hotel and you go to Cafe Nero for your coffee. And, um, you know, if you run out of shampoo, you can go to the body shop, right? It's There's a sort of the brands, the streetscape has that same kind of corporate um, sameness that you encounter in any other bustling European city. At the same time, there's a lot of weirdness and you realize that it's a very segregated city and that you, I mean, the, the experience that really brought it home for me was I, on my first trip, I think it might've been the second trip. I was going to see a guy named Billy McKee and Billy McKee is this legendary IRA gunman who was born just after the partition of Ireland in the 1920s. And joined the IRA as a teenager and was in prison pretty much every decade after that and was one of the founders of the provisional IRA, which is the kind of more violent uh, offshoot that I'm writing about that that came into being um, in the early 70s. And um, Billy McKee is now this old man and he lives in West Belfast in this very Irish Republican Catholic neighborhood and he's a legend there. And... Um, it was an incredible experience seeing him. It was like something out of a, I don't know. I mean, it was, he, <laughs> you know, he wakes up every morning and puts on a suit so that he can go to mass first thing in the morning. And he has these false teeth that he moves around his mouth as he talks to you. And there was a clock in the other room, like a grandfather clock that was <laughs> ticking as we talked. He's a very severe figure. But um, I was staying at the Hilton and I got a taxi. I hailed a taxi to take me to his house. Belfast is a tiny city. And I told the cabbie the address and he seemed a little confused. And the cabbie was an older guy, probably 60. And I figured he'd been driving a cab for a while. And I realized he didn't know how to get there. And this place was like two miles away. And I realized this is a Protestant cab driver who, if you give him an address in the heart of Republican West Belfast, he doesn't know how to get there and he doesn't want to go. And the deeper into this neighborhood we got and the more lost he got, the more awkward it became. And um, eventually I said, well, <laughs> there, there was a guy in a corner and I said, why don't you pull over and ask for directions? And that was like the last thing he wanted to do. So American of you. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Again and again, I was reminded of this. But um, so there are those eerie dissonances that happen just again and again and again. So let's talk about, you know, physical division versus psychological division, which is clearly what you're talking about with that story. I mean, do you, is there still a sense 
and the time you spend in Belfast that there really is, I mean, obviously there's no wall, there's no, right, but this topic is is very big again, obviously because of Brexit right now, just in terms of how things are actually partitioned and well, what, there are walls. Oh, are there walls? Okay, so talk about that. I didn't even know that. There are physical walls. So in when the Troubles broke out in um, the late 1960s, you had this a, a series of things that happened rather quickly. You had neighborhoods at that point that had been pretty divided by, on the basis of religion, for decades. But they weren't completely divided, and you had mixed areas, and you had Catholic families in Protestant areas, and vice versa. And there was a sort of ethnic cleansing that happened really over the course of a summer in which if you had a few Protestant families in a Catholic neighborhood, they would be driven out. And if you had a few Catholic families in a Protestant neighborhood, they'd be driven out. And if you had mixed families, they would also be driven out. And so you had all this migration within the city and also people just leaving altogether. And then you had these ethnic enclaves, basically, and people started drawing up these barriers around these communities. It sounds crazy. It sounds like something out of out of The Walking Dead to describe it now. But But what they would do is they would hijack a bus, turn the bus on its side – and then, you know, have it actually there sort of blocking off an area. And then you'd have young guys with guns who would stand on top of the bus and police who came in and out. And you had these barriers that slowly became more formalized. And eventually they became actual steel walls and there's concertina wire and fences of different sorts. These are known as peace walls and they're still everywhere in the cities in Northern Ireland. They divide neighborhoods. They divide communities. Um, and it's interesting because they're sort of a mark of shame. Everybody knows we should be tearing down the peace walls. And yet the government, which committed to taking them all down by 2023, there's more peace walls now than there were at the end of the troubles. Why and, is that? Well, because because the reconciliation hasn't happened. And so there's a sense in which peace is being preserved, but it's preserved the way you keep animals from going after each other at the zoo. I mean, you just, you just fence them off. And when they, when the government announced this initiative to try and take down the walls, um, there was polling on this. And most people who live in the immediate areas that are, that are close to these walls said, no, you know, we actually would feel unsafe if you took them down. It sounds insane, but this is what it's like there today. Yeah. Well, so tell me more about that. Tell me more about, okay. So you went in 2014, this book came out this year, so what, you spent four years basically going yeah, back, back and, and forth? forth? I made seven trips. And what was, you know, as you made each of those trips, how did your understanding of the geography and the topography of the city and the way it's put together and, and how it reflects, as it so clearly does, these bizarre subterranean divisions? I mean, did you become more and more familiar with it? Do you feel that it's still a place where there are untold numbers of pockets of resistance peace walls there's a, there's a narcissism of minor differences thing here right where everybody actually looks the same right it's mostly a white christian city and people tend to dress the same so so often what it means is that it's when somebody opens their mouth and they start talking that immediately if you're in Belfast, you situate that person. You can plot them on a matrix and you have a rough idea of what their background is and what part of the city they come from and what their faith might be and what their politics might be and what sports teams they might support. And those those perceptions may or may not be accurate, but but immediately people make those kinds of judgments. And I never got good enough. My ear was never good enough to, to do that kind of um, – plotting of the people around me. But I certainly got to know the neighborhoods and which neighborhoods um, were okay for somebody like me to walk through and which might not be. What does that mean, somebody like you? Like, what well, would there be to set you apart? You know, I'm looking at you, which people listening to this can't, but, you know, to me, you look like you would fit in pretty well in a white Irish <laughs> city. Christian so, city. so yeah. you know, what's the... Well, no. So when I say someone like me, I actually mean it's safer. For, it's probably a safer city for me than it is for most people in the city in the sense that when I open my mouth, I'm an outsider. I don't, I don't fit in that matrix. And I thought about this a lot as I was 
doing the reporting for the story. Weirdly enough, the thing that I kept thinking about was um, <laughs> was Truman Capote going going to Kansas uh, because it's this question of whether your outsiderness is an advantage or a disadvantage. And I was always struck by the fact, and there are, there are other reporters even today who do this, where when I plunk down in a place, often I'm trying to mirror the people that I'm meeting with and I'm trying to make them feel comfortable and speak in an idiom that will lead them to want to open up to me. And I'm always intrigued by reporters who sort of take the opposite tack, which, you know, Truman Capote lands in, in Kansas with his, like... Fedora. Kind of, his, yeah, with his, like, <laughs> his, his epic muffler and, um, and his, uh, his big city airs and embraces that sense in which it's like, I am an alien and I have landed here from the planet Mars. Please tell me your story. And um, there was a little bit of that for me in Belfast where there were places that I could go where somebody else might not be able to go because as soon as I open my mouth, then it's like, oh, you're from New York. Well, you know, my cousin lives in New York. He lives in the Bronx. Or it, 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 People would find some connection with me rather than seeing seeing me as as um different or hostile or threatening in some sectarian way okay so let's talk about now because obviously this is a big moment for the peace process or you know the end of the troubles or the scar as you referred to it in in your op-ed the other day um and i was very struck by this this thing that you said in a vanity fair piece recently about how quickly northern ireland and belfast changed back in the in the 60s and you said in 1968, things look relatively normal, as normal had been defined up to that point. By 1972, there are bombs going off every day and people shouting at each other in the street. Shooting so, at each other in the street. Excuse me, shooting at each other in the street. I clearly, shouting too. clearly do not have my reading glasses. Um, and shooting at each other in the street. So that's such a vivid image, right, of, of all those things and just how quickly a city can go to destruction and chaos. And I'm assuming, and you can you can speak to this, that, you know, all of that physical evidence has been sort of repaired and you know but but when you think about what's happening now and there's so much nervousness about what might happen or will happen with Brexit and how quickly things could deteriorate again and especially given everything you've said in this conversation about actually how weirdly fragile the piece really is on the ground which is certainly not at all the way we tend to see it from here i mean what do you think about what might be in store. And I know yeah. I'm asking you to sort of prognosticate about something that is not your... No, I mean, here's the thing. Nobody knows anything when it comes to what may be around the corner in in with Brexit in general and with the peace in Northern Ireland in particular. So I'm happy to prognosticate because <laughs> I, you know, um, uh, I don't think anybody really has any expertise that, that bear in a helpful way on this. Um, it's a weird one. I thought about this a lot because I, again, as the naive Panglossian American, I had a sense when I started going to Belfast that what I kept thinking was you have these young people now who've grown up after the troubles and they've grown up with the internet. How could anyone ever want to go back to the way things were before. You just, you couldn't possibly want to do it. And I didn't, there were things I didn't understand. So there's a, there's a story that I, I told in the original New Yorker piece. It's not in the book, but, um, I was driving along one day with this guy, Michael McConville, and we drove along a road and he was pointing out that, all, that on one side of the road was, he said, this is an interface area, which means it's an area where these two communities abut. one side of the road is all Protestant and the other side is all Catholic. And on our left, there was this little strip of businesses. It was like a little curry house and a liquor store. And um, there was a Subway sandwich franchise. And I said to Michael, so if I live on the Protestant side of the street and I'm hungry, would I walk out my front door and walk 25 yards across the street to the Subway franchise in the Catholic area? And Michael said, not a chance. And of course, to an American way of thinking, I'm like, but that's ridiculous. I mean, how inconvenient. Why would you conceivably walk 10 minutes out of your way to patronize a different outpost of an international franchise? It seemed crazy to me. And I just thought young people will never put up with that. 
convenience will win the day and knit this society together. So I floated this idea to a number of people and they told me, well, the problem is that young people today haven't experienced the violence, but they have been imbibing the ideology and the kind of clannish tribal sectarianism. And so they, they have all the ideology, but none of the sense of consequence. They have, they have none of the sense that if we were to go back to war, then, you know, one day your cousin goes out to buy a dozen eggs and comes back missing a leg. And I went one summer during the summers that they have what they call marching season in July. And there are these big belligerent sectarian marches and bonfires. And it was genuinely scary. And it was mostly young people out at night, drunk and angry. And that worries me. I don't think that there's a scenario in which Northern Ireland's going to go back to the way things were, even in the worst case scenario with Brexit. I just don't think there's the appetite there. And I think there's enough people who have lived through war who don't want to go back. But, um, but I do worry about the kind of undercurrent of tension and the potentially dangerous sort of scenario in which you have limited acts of violence and then irrational escalation on one side or the other. Right. And that's a very different thing than we have here, at least in the sense. I mean, it's striking to me that in both of your memories of Belfast prior to your visits for this book, the thing you remember is the the military, right? Yeah. Which seems to be just sort of an ever-present thing on the landscape and what that does to shape a culture and, and the landscape in which it exists, right? Because if you're used to that being a feature of the world you see around you all the time, it's just that much more accessible to you, you know, in a moment of, as you say, irrational anger or passion. Or I think that's so right. And there was a, it's funny, there was a piece in the Irish Times a few days ago by a novelist who was writing about having grown up near the border. And he tells this haunting story of being a child on a school bus when a British soldier gets on to the bus to check the bus and you know, the soldier has a rifle dangling and the sound of the rifle hitting the chairs as it walks by. And what he said is, you know, that you have that experience once as a child, you're on the school bus and, a, and, a, and an armed soldier gets on to check the bus and it changes the way you see the world forever. Okay. I think maybe we'll leave it there with that completely haunting image that gave me goosebumps unless you have on that on that grim note yes on that grim i have nothing more redemptive to offer you all right well i will offer something redemptive which is that you can learn more about belfast and the troubles and a lot of other interesting stuff in patrick's book say nothing a true story of murder and memory in northern ireland thanks again patrick thank you this podcast was brought to you by the new york institute for the humanities at nyu and the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. This episode was produced by Ben Branstein. You can find us on Stitcher, iTunes, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more information, visit us at www.nyihumanities.org.